So I, maybe the question I would ask all of you is that in doing your exploration with your podcast and, and everything else you've done, besides that, I mean, what red flag should we be paying attention to? I mean, I think specifically here in the United States, and I think this is why your podcast in particular is so valuable, is that you're like digging into it, you're providing really excellent analysis into these things. And it's something, something that can be applied on the smaller scale. Because I know people on a very individual level are like, oh my God, I can kind of piece this together now. I understand what happened, how I got sucked into this thing. Mm -hmm. But I think we're seeing this happen with millions and millions of people right now. And I know you can't speak, you know, like you can't save the world by, fix, you know, you can't fix all these problems by providing all the solutions to this. But I think there are many people who have the intuition, there's a feeling in them. And I have this too, where it's like something is fucking off here. Or people that were in my life that were frankly apolitical, who didn't really pay attention, didn't really vote, didn't really care about politics on any real level, are coming to me. And they're like, hey, something is just not right. I don't know what's going on, but something is really wrong. Because they're watching the news. It's one horrific thing after the other. Um, and I just get this real feeling that people want to kind of have something clearly defined, like, look, look out. This is a, this is a, this is a signal. This is a sign. This is a red flag. Um, and I imagine this could be applicable on a very small scale, but also on a societal scale as well. I don't know what any of your thoughts were on that. If you had any suggestions or you know, resources to point to in that regard, maybe I could point to Derek first and then we can just go from there. I think you're seeing it with all the mailboxes being taken away. We don't need symbols. I mean, one of the things about Trump is he's always been telling us what he's going to do and then does it. And that's, that's part of what, if you're looking at it holistically, part of the mystification of it, but it's also uh, a tried and tested trick. I'll say this. I had a, a, a QAnon, QAnon adjacent. I don't know how deeply involved she is, but she's challenged me on a few things. She's a yoga instructor on my feed. I don't know if I know her in person, but in the last couple of days, I've seen her posting on my on uh, my feed, uh, challenging me on you know uh, the real problem is the Clintons and all of this stuff. And I wrote an article last week from based on our conspirituality podcast about child trafficking with my interview with Reagan Williams, who's a foster youth expert. She does the work. She is on, she works with foster and traumatized children on a daily basis for years, hands on. This is somebody who is actually doing something. And I wanted to use that interview on big think just a to get, you know, the message out more, but it also provides me with something. And this is what I did this morning when being challenged about this whole, like, why is no one talking about Jeffrey Epstein, which I'm like, well, what are you looking at? Plenty of people are talking about this, but to be like, okay, you really care about child abuse and trafficking. Here is an interview with an expert and a list of at least 10 resources that you can donate your money to. Mm -hmm. Here it is. So if you want to do something, here you go. I'm providing you the resources. And after I said that, she just replied, thanks, smiley face, and then stopped anything. And, and, that, and that I feel is what is important with this because the reality is, and Matthew could probably speak to this in terms of cult survivors, is that when they're indoctrinated, you're not going to pull them out in any capacity. There has to be a, a breakthrough. There has to be a moment where they want to come out and then you can help them out. But it's the same thing. So from my perspective, it's always, I, I think often of the mantra, may all ha may, in the yoga community, may all beings be happy and free. If you really want to take the bodhisattva vow, that also means beings that you don't agree with. And what we're seeing now is that with yoga and this, these influencers doing this is that they really don't care about the people that don't agree with them. So then what does that really say about their practice and their mantras that they've been saying? So my attitude is one at a time, one at a time, someone comes to you, offer them resources and guidance. And because, because whenever you look at something and like, I want to change the world, you're not understanding that that happens one person at a time. It happens on a small scale that then reverberates. And the way that I feel that the yoga community in America, since at least the 1980s, and we can probably go further into that, but has really looked at it as a, we're going to fix, we're going to meditate for world peace. And for this one hour where everyone around the world's meditating, there's going to be world peace, right? Because they feel better about themselves. And that's, I think, is really short-sighted. But Matthew, was I correct in the assumption about cults and 
being able to help on that level. Yeah, and also it brings up a sort of very melancholic and somewhat demoralizing point, which is that one person at a time is really hard to contemplate when you're talking about incredible speed in radicalization and, and just, how, just how many people are actually involved. Um, Steve Hassan uh, made this point really eloquently in one of our episodes, uh, talking about how, you know, the the on the interpersonal level, the person who's been indoctrinated or who has, you know, is really is really subject to a kind of mind control. They're not they're not thinking with their own agency, and they've they've undergone a personality change as well in some way uh, that they're not going to respond to. Uh, anything that makes them makes them feel defensive or stupid, and so you know derek 's response um, to to this person on the feed is is really on is really on point it 's like it 's like I hear that you 're really concerned, so this is what I did, and maybe you would appreciate these resources uh, that 's probably the maximal confrontation that would be useful, uh, and otherwise, if you know the person. Uh, you've, you've, you know, in, in cult theory anyway, uh, you maintain the, you maintain the, the, the relationship as best you can, because the thing about, you know, an online social phenomenon like QAnon is that it creates false bonds between people. And, and when it, when it's over or when people fall away from it, it's not like they're going to keep their QAnon friends. It's not like they're going to hang out with each other. They, they, people's families are being ruined uh, and uh, people are betting a lot of emotional capital on the, the notion that uh, somehow they are, they, they're, they're, they're be, they've become friends with somebody because they're both trolling Chrissy Teigen. And it's just not true. It's just, it's just not going to work. On the other hand, what cult discourse just does not do and what it's not equipped for, and this is kind of a crisis for, for me personally because I've invested so much into studying this literature, is that it really doesn't understand the... Um, the, 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 the technological aspect. And this is where the interview that, that Derek did with Imran Ahmed was so profound for me because uh, Ahmed runs the Center for Combating Digital Hate out of the UK. And you know, he basically proves that deplatforming, blocking, isolating, treating this material like the actual virus uh, in the world is the only real way of beating the algorithms that want you to engage with it and that are actually monetizing your engagement. So I've been pro pro progressing uh, on this pathway by with kindness, with as much politeness as I can manage. When I know somebody uh, who's, who's you know, sp spouting conspirituality, you know, I have been willing to engage them on friendly terms and to do what I can and to nurture the relationship under the belief that the relationship is, is the thing that has to persist because the ideology will fall away. Uh, and what Ahmed points out is that the time that you spent engaging with that person, the time that you spend trying to repair that relationship, that boosts their content in the algorithm. It makes it more, it makes the actual, the, the, the QAnon bullshit actually more attractive to Mark Zuckerberg's uh, profit model. And that's just, that's mind blowing. And so I have this, I found this, just to, just to finish up on the cult thing, I have, here's a crossroads statement for you. It's a tweet from Julian Field, who's one of the QAnon anonymous uh, uh, hosts, he's the producer. He tweeted out a while back, I disagree with those who insist QAnon is completely described by the word cult. It has useful elements, but I find the angle fundamentally ignores, and then he has a list, adherent dispersion, like how broad-based, how variant the movement is, variance in engagement, how many people take it seriously? How many are LARPing? How many are just entertained? Feedback loops with political discourse. And then he says, mental illness, addiction, and wealth disparity. So basically, he's, he's, saying, he's saying that um, not, not, only, not only does, does cult theory, which really emerged out of the 1980s in an analog era, 
not only does it not understand its digital digital platforming right now, it also has to take a broader look at all of these other aspects of public and political health. And and so I'm I'm kind of at this crossroads of trying to figure out how how something very old can stretch and if it can actually. Mm. Yeah, Julian, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, we talk about this stuff a lot. So yeah, I'm right there with Matthew on, on that analysis. I feel like um, in terms of your original question, uh, because of my temperament, I come back to this place of saying, well, one of the red flags in a society in terms of the uh, movement towards fascism, I think, is people really losing touch with reality, where if we live in a post-fact society, if we live in a society where the president can lie every time he opens his mouth and the, there's, a, there's a pitched battle for you know, which, which media outlet is going to be framed as just complete propaganda or fake news, if, if it, the more that stuff swirls and there's no place to, to plant any sense of reality, uh, the more larger groups of people can get swept up in completely untrue notions of, for example, what this election is about. You know, is, is this, when, when, when people I know are saying, well, really, the reason I've now become a Trump supporter, which I never would have thought could be possible, is that this election is really about saving the children. And Trump is the one who is, who is going to crack down on all these pedophiles and sex traffickers. To me, that's, that's an expression of, within our public discourse, just a complete uh, unmooring from any sense of facts, evidence, healthy critical thinking, understanding how logical argumentation works. And so I, I know that it's not a sexy answer, but for me, like continuing to try to hold myself accountable in those ways and to try to have my interactions underline the importance of why we think what we think and if we can argue for it coherently and, and how to see through arguments that are just filled with logical fallacies and, and poorly evidenced outrageous assumptions, to me, that's, that remains of the essence. Can I, can I just uh, not totally devil's advocate for a moment, but to say that the Save the Children uh, hashtag not only, not only um, brand washes uh, the adrenochrome fantasies of QAnon, it also manipulates the Epstein case and everything that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. And so um, to the extent that, you know, this guy gets to kill himself or he is murdered uh, by, you know, Barr and his associates in, in the Manhattan jail, uh, and we don't know how long it's going to take for Ghislaine Maxwell to actually have to speak on record, uh, to the extent that, you know, Keith Rainier was put away, but, you know, and all the FBI files were open and available for people to, to look at, but nobody's really going to investigate them that far. There's this sort of, like, sense of lack of closure with regard to are we really addressing networked violence against children? Are we really addressing, um, uh, you know, organized, organized trafficking? And so there's a, you know, and this to, to speak to, to Reagan Williams' point, again, we have this situation in which like an, um, you know, an amplified fantastical uh, metaphor for what is actually happening is displacing what is actually happening. Uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't actually help anybody. Can I just ask, this is just out of curiosity. I meant to address this when I interviewed uh, Jared, Jared uh, Yates Sexton. I am trying to figure this out. Okay. So you have, this is just out of curiosity, right? It's just, I just want to get your thoughts on this. I'm sure this fits into culting or cult dynamics in general and the psychology of it, but you literally have Trump associated with Epstein. He's been on his plane. He's been at his parties. You see them together. It's very obvious that he's implicated in this whole thing. And yet he's supposed to be a part of this whole Q thing where he's a part of this operation to uh, expose a, 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 a child sex trafficking ring involving all these elites. How do they make sense of that? How do they, what kind of You're, mental gymnastics yeah. are they engaging in to do this and i'm sure this applies to other subjects but like this one in particular is so fucking obvious 
like how does a person in that state of mind from your understanding, your research or your engagement with these people, how do they understand that? How do they make with, sense of that? With Q, there's really specific tools with regard to the um, interpretation, the baking process uh, that, 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 the, that the gamification, that the gamers engage with, right? So, so you know, there's, there's a Q drop, it's complete gobbledygook. There's like, uh, you know, there's this commentator who's, who says that it's predictive of that thing. And then there's another commentator who says, well, it's actually retrodictive of this other thing. Uh, and so they have actually built into their discourse the ability to interpret anything as anything. Uh, and whatever, whatever Trump is doing, uh, he can be claimed to be doing the opposite. You know, Derek said uh, that, you know, he's showing us by having the, the, the post office uh, take you know, mailboxes off the street, exactly what he's doing, or he's showing us by sending unmarked minivans into, into uh, Portland to just kidnap protesters off the street. He's showing us exactly what he's doing. I guarantee you that there will be a completely reversed QAnon narrative for what those actions actually are that paint him in the preordained role. So it's actually really, it's your, I think your question is coming out of, you know, how can you not mm. see something that's obvious, mm. but that, but you're starting, you're starting after the indoctrination point, which already gave a person the tool, the tools to turn something completely upside down and inside out, uh, because that's what they need to do. That's what the entire, that's what the entire game uh, um, uh, proceeds along. Yeah, just really quickly, the taking the red pill always means whatever context it's used in, it always means reality is not what it appears to be, right? Yes, right. And so once, once if, if that is your governing sort of template, then you can spin anything and say, well, no, 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 it's actually all part of this other narrative yeah. that fits my belief. Yeah. I also yeah. wonder with so much emphasis on light and darkness and spiritual practices, there's always this, first of all, people are always seduced by this idea of, being part of a group that has secret knowledge that no one else has. And that is, that is, to use Matthew's term, baked into these practices, at least how they're presented in the indoctrination process. And the, the, so you can, you, I've actually seen the Daily Show, one of the correspondents whose name's escaping me, did a great roundup when he was going around to Trump, Trump rallies last year. But there's always this sense where he'll ask them something and they're about numerology, for example, because there's a whole numerology in QAnon. And there's this, uh, the, the, the respondents will be like, yeah, that's, that's, his, that's his number. And then he'll be like, what does it mean? He's like, he knows what it means because they can punt it, right? But it's, you know, that, that is just classically part of these practices, this idea that your, your knowledge and and because of the yin yang symbol, how everything's merged, they can just kind of point to that. See, everything's related. It's this theory of everything model that just they extrapolate from and try to apply in places where it really doesn't. You know, Trump is not playing chess. Period. Like I don't think he could play checkers. Like I'm. Like it's just so blatant. There's no. There's no jujitsu. He's the best checkers to... player. He's really <laughs> tremendous at checkers. <laughs> so 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 yes. one thing that I want to say about the com about the completeness uh, and the patterning that you just referred to. I think it's. I think that's under. Um, I mean, we sort of refer to the comfort of a totalizing template that is provided by a big tent. Uh, conspiracy theory like like QAnon, um, but uh, you know it's it's I think it's significant that we have also as a culture experienced and and spoken openly about the continuing fragmentation of culture discourse news sources uh, the privatization of information. Uh, and so it's, you know, even though the Q world is not coherent, it, it contains the promise of coherence, mm. uh, even though, and, and, and it offers a process of meaning making that I think is very difficult to replicate in um, a popular sense, you know, it's, it's like, 
you know, if, if you are deeply invested in a particular academic discipline, you know what the parameters of meaning making are, right? But you also know that, well, this is religious studies and in social psychology, they would look at it, at it differently, or this is epidemiology and in, and in neurology, it's, you know, there are different factors involved. So, so you can have a language by which you speak about the most important things of your life, but you don't have a totalizing language. Uh, you don't have a Bible, as it were, uh, or, or, you know, or, or, I don't know. An oracle. F- or an oracle or the full sort of complement of Greek mythology that you might have on board in an, in, an, in an oral culture way back when. And so there's something, do you know, guys, have you seen, have you seen that, like, um, that uh, map of, all of the relationships between dark organizations or, you know, shady organizations that, that uh, is featured in Q groups. It's like, you can't even read it. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's, there are English terms there, you know, there are English words. And if you like zoom in and, and strain your eyes, you can see that there there's, there's actually words there, but it looks like, the Narnia landscape or something like that from a distance. It looks like a map of Mordor or, or like it, it's, it's totalizing. And I think it, it allows people to feel like their world is together in some way, even if it's terrorizing. And there's also, there's not even any arrows on that map, by the way. Right. So you don't even have to, at this point, they don't have to show the correlations or the relationships. It's just, they're grouped together, but they're just a bunch of words. And people will take that as some sort of evidence that there's a global conspiracy. Well, you know that the arrows are invisible, right? Because they represent <laughs> your neuro, neurotransmitters and you can't really see that down to that resolution. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> 